Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Lorenzo's Music Podcast. I'm Tom, and on today's show, I talk with an artist who's based out of Seattle, and they are they started out as a solo musician, but then they worked with someone who was in another band and their stuff. Actually, we talk a lot about gear on this one because one of the things they do is uh, they have two synths, but they also now added guitar to their set, but they have in-ears and the way that they put it out is through the DAW that they use. So we get kind of deep into the, the weeds. Is that the deep? We, we talk a lot about gear because improving your stage show and getting lots of gadgets and things to make you sound cool that you can take with you that improve what you're doing. That's just what us musicians do. We could talk about it for hours. So we, but it's, it's interesting because his setup is really cool. And uh, we also talk about the album that he had that just came out and it came out about a year ago and how I discovered their music. So here's that interview starting right now. My name is Christian. Uh, I'm an electronic rock artist called User, that's US3R. I'm located in Seattle, Washington, and uh, I'm a tech dork during the day and a musician at night. So it is pronounced User. I was guessing yeah. it, when I first saw you, I wasn't sure. And then I was like, oh, it's like Leet Speak. It's, it's... Yes, Leet Speak. I'm glad <laughs> you picked up on that. That is exactly <laughs> what it was. I think it's just because it's only got the one alterated yeah. letter it doesn't it, it's not using a bunch of them so it's hard to see it first so one random night i was uh like i don't know googling around about just random things and and i discovered the term numeronym numeronym is the name of that phenomenon where people use numbers in substitution for letters okay and there's different forms of it right so like in the tech industry sometimes you'll see something shortened like um Mm -hmm. W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, or internationalization would be I18N. Those mm -hmm. are numeronyms, but also numeronyms like US3R, same thing. So elite speak is literally just numeronyms. Right, I yeah. Randomly like happened upon that information and I just never forgot it. I was like, oh, that's very interesting. And it was around the same time too where all these startups were using uh, or not using vowels in their names like you had your flicker and you, yeah you know and all that stuff where they'd like the letter e didn't get used whereas you you just turned it into a number well you know <laughs> ironically um i spent about the first 10 years of my career doing software and um for those who are professional software engineers they spend a lot of time in their um terminal like yeah. doing kind of command line stuff and um there's a particular folder in linux that is dot slash usr and I yeah. originally wanted that to be my artist name, that whole thing. Oh, okay. But it was okay. like a little too gnarly. And well, so I and ended also, up just going with US 3R. <laughs> right. And then you run into problems with, uh, if you're using the dot in it, like some things, yeah. like most people, and also just to let you know, my background is also web development and software development. Perfect. Front end guy though. It sounds like with you talking about the terminal, you were probably more on the back end maybe? I started off kind of in front end, I guess you could say. Um, and I would say that the front end and the back end sort of converged when Node came out um, just because like, you know, we had the ability to like run servers and do server side API development and stuff as part okay. of front end engineering. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I ended up becoming a full stack engineer for several years. I work at Facebook now, so it's like I'm like okay. a technical program manager now. I chose to get away from engineering because I wanted to be more of a decision maker and a communicator. And I think like getting into product and program was kind of like necessary for that, yeah. in my opinion. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And also to add on to that too, I'm also a Linux user. As a matter of fact, our entire yeah. band is... Uh, we use Ubuntu Studio exclusively throughout the band, and I came up with a method to use GitHub to actually share our production suite, <laughs> our actual tracking, like the DAW in yeah. GitHub. Yeah, 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 yeah. I actually spoke at the Ubuntu Summit back in 2022 when they opened up again, and oh we went to God. Prague, and I actually, we played, and I actually did a talk in Prague talking about how I came up with this method to use GitHub to share um, Ardor files, because we use Ardor as our DAW. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that that's an interesting problem. I used to do that too, uh, because project, um, the project folder structure for um, Logic Pro has a lot of hidden elements in it. Mm -hmm. And like, 
interacting in the UI of a Mac with um, hidden elements is a little bit annoying. And so like dealing with it with command line was easier. Yeah. Um, it's just a flag. And then uh, also just like doing syncing and backup of things. Like I was at the time I was very like into Git and all of that. And so mm -hmm. nowadays I've sort of like gotten off that train and I don't do as much of that, but now it's more like what I've done is, is created an entire file system that lives inside of my shared drive with uh, the whatever the the Mac like it's it's like Apple cloud or something they call it and like so mm -hmm. basically when I get any new computer I just make that the main entry to anything and okay. I don't do anything locally on my computer and so like all of my music is all backed up in iCloud because of that and all of my project work and visual and and it's it's a little expensive in terms of the file right. sizes, but it's yeah. like I've I've got like multiple computers that are just always in sync with each other because of that, and I think it's like way easier to deal with. Hmm. Yeah, we uh, the cost for us using Git, and then of course we have to use Git LFS for the wave files because they're gigantic, or yeah. at least the way that Git views them. But uh, it, we've actually. I mean, we've got like maybe three albums that are backed up now on public Git's, mm -hmm. uh, GitHub files or repositories, GitHub files. And uh, it, 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 oddly enough, we only just had to bump up to the storage of the second tier of storage, which is $10. It's actually pretty cheap. It's almost yeah. like Amazon-ish cheap, you know, like AWS. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it's been, it's been, I did not expect to have jump right into Linux and GitHub well, conversation well, with to, a musician. I used to actually work at AWS. So oh, you did? Like, yeah. Okay. I'm all about that. And you know, what's ironic is, is that like, I used to build tons of toy, like app ideas and mm -hmm. I just had tons and tons of like half built things inside of my AWS accounts and recently discovered that I was getting billed like excessively for something. And I went to go like turn it off. And I realized that I had set up this ultra complicated, like chef built, like automation built, like stack that was okay. like so complicated to turn off that I like literally just like canceled my account. And I was like, that would actually be easier <laughs> than me it's doing just this. It's easier to kill it. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's it's really funny because like that's actually like a very common pain point for companies that go into the cloud is is that the billing is not accessible. It's not obvious. And so like you know, the whole idea of, of companies like overspending when they intended to get off of on prem high cost solutions, like mm -hmm. that's like a big kind of pain point. And then and, and, and then like, what was really fascinating is, is that like, even with the cloud and even with professional services and architects and all that stuff, people still overspend and they still build the wrong thing. It still doesn't scale right mm -hmm. and all of that. And so like, very interestingly, AWS came up with this product called Lambda, which was just functions as a service, Yeah, which literally containerized a hundred percent of the entire thing. And it was just like on demand, super elastic, and you could not mess it up no matter how hard you tried. And I think mm -hmm. that was like the best possible response to that problem. And like, yeah, yeah. so like a lot of those apps that I were building in the, back in the day was like using bleeding edge versions of that stuff. Because I was like, oh, like it would be really cool if I could just like design an API and a YAML file and like mm -hmm. just deploy an entire product. And so coming back to it, 10 years later or seven years later or whatever, how long it's been trying to figure out which thing to turn off is actually quite <laughs> difficult considering oh, that yeah. no human hands turned it on in the first place. It was all from deployment scripts. So yeah. it was like, I was just like, okay, this is freaking unbelievably complicated and I don't want to deal with this. And it was like probably one in the morning or something when I had right. the time to do that. And I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, no, going back to those years after the fact is always like, you, you think you're doing it so smart when you're setting it up. And I'm sure there are readme files all over the place. But then it's like, what the hell am I talking about in this readme file? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know? God forbid we document stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's actually really funny. So like my live touring rig um, is complicated enough to where I have created documentation for it, for like the routing of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that way, like I can actually like re understand it if I need to. Luckily it hasn't quite left my mind yet mm -hmm. that I need to read that. But like, you know, like current me is always trying to think of a nice thing I can do for future me. 
You know okay. what I mean? Like, yeah, just as like a courtesy of you, like, I know I'm going to forget this. No, my, so. my saying used to be, uh, cause I could get things to work and they're like, but that might, fi- you know, mess this up. And I would always <laughs> say that's future Tom's problem. And I yeah. hate that guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so your, your touring rig, <laughs> your touring rig, um, I'm glad you brought that up. What is, cause you, you play solo, right? I know there are pictures of two of you. Yeah, but then I so, see a lot of you performing solo. So tell me, what is your live setup? So like the first several years of my act was solo. And then Travis and I, um, Travis is my current bandmate. Um, like he and I uh, met because he was like coming to a few of my shows and I got to know him a little bit. And he was also a musician. Um, we ended up kind of, um, I can't remember exactly how it started, but I ended up offering to play guitar as a stand-in for his band, which was like an electronic pop punk sort of thing. Okay. And up until that point, I had not been playing like guitar in my user show. Um, So just as a background, like my family are all professional musicians for a living. And so I've played many instruments for my whole life. So I'm very comfortable with this. The problem is, is that the type of writing that I had been doing under user was very not like that. So I just didn't have guitar stuff or drum stuff or anything like in my music at the time. It was all written in the DAW. And um, so when I started offering to play as stand-ins for my friends and like Travis in particular, I got to do that with the evenings, his band, the evenings. Um hmm. I was like, hey, like, can you return the favor and do this for my band as well? And so we ended up just joining each other's bands over the long term. And so now it's like, you know, we play this electronic pop punk stuff and I help with the production of that for the live setup. And we just happen to use the same rig as my user thing. And because we're in both bands, like we know exactly like how to practice stuff. We know how to get the lighting cues right. We know how to do all of the stuff. And it's like so much less work of communication work because we just like are on the same page about everything. And, um, I would say like, um, we've been doing that setup for maybe two years. We started doing that like during the pandemic Mm -hmm. and, um, we played maybe 30 shows like that so far. And it's been like pretty cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. He's like super rock star energy. Like he's like all over the stage and like being all crazy. And I'm kind of the more like, you know, singing on the mic thing. Um, so yeah, I would say that like it's been a it's been a good setup. Um so yeah, to kind of go back to your question like what is what is the rig? Um so I'll talk about the instruments first, then I'll talk about the actual setup. And so the instruments yeah. are like as of right now, we both have um Moogs uh, as our synthesizers. Oh, really? And we have um guitars and both have vocals, right? So I've got my subsequent 37 and he's got his grandmother and then we have uh, like MIDI controller keyboards, like Elisa's keyboard. So that way we can map master bus effects on all the knobs and we can do kind of live DJing stuff like repeating and echoing and just destroying noises and just all the cool stuff. We also have sampler pads like built into that. So it's very compartmentalized, very easy to kind of just. Is it all on. set up on like a rack? Uh, so it's like, it's actually very straightforward. We just have a double, double decker like keyboard stand. And so we have like the Elise's keyboard, um, on top of the grandmother. And then on mine, I don't have a double decker because I've kind of relinquished the DJ ish responsibilities to Travis. Okay. Cause it's like kind of like in the beginning, he, what we weren't playing guitar yet, actually, we were just doing the keys thing. And so like he was doing a lot of DJing and that was like keeping his idle hands busy. Right. And, Mm -hmm. um, once we started incorporating the guitars and things into it, then the setup got a lot more kind of just genuinely human, I guess you could say, because now it's like every single song we could play a hundred percent on the synths if we wanted to, or we could play it on the guitars if we wanted to. But what we end up doing is sort of taking turns, like having like a dominant element, you know? So like he'll be the synth guy on this song and I'll be the guitar guy on the song, or we'll oh, gotcha. both do the synth thing if certain songs call for it. And then do you leave the, the guitar strapped on the whole time or are you yeah, setting it aside? I've, I found that like, so I have a guitar that I use for sort of live novelty and it's a plexiglass, um, Steve Vai, like Ibanez nice. knockoff and it's okay. got lights inside of it. And 
the jack on it is kind of like so like the bottom of the guitar the jack is like kind of at an angle and it's really towards the where it would sit mm. and so like taking it off in the middle of the show i've had issues where i like maybe might damage the jack okay and i don't have like a good proper guitar stand on stage with me and so like I just keep it on. You have all that set up, but you don't have the. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like I just keep it on because, like you know. And the other thing is, it's just like losing stuff in a very like flickery, bright, like live sh uh, light show. Because we plus do, I've like, seen you that you wear the neon glasses too. Uh, I haven't worn those in probably two or three years, but oh, like, okay. it's all kind right. of like it was like a fun thing at the time because I was working on an album concept called Glow that was going to mm -hmm. be a lot of like. I don't know, paying homage to a lot of the different sort of like uh, aesthetic stuff that's of yeah. the sound of my music. Um, but as as it always happens, like inspiration takes you in unexpected places, life happens and you just kind of like, you know what, like, I'm not really like vibing with that idea as much now. And I'm just doing something different. Right. So we have all of this stuff right on stage. So the two Moogs, the controller, the computer, we've got two guitars, two mics. And we also have the problem of like, we're playing loud music and it's hard to hear. So we got in your monitors. So basically oh. what I did was, is I, I, um, got an X 32 digital rack. Mm -hmm. Um, I got a patch bay, like an XLR patch bay. Mm -hmm. I got, um, an XLR interface, which is kind of like a eight channel preamp. It's like one of those Behringer preamps. And I just use it because it's got combo jacks on it. And like yeah. combo jack patch bays do not exist like that. It's just really hard to find them. Really? And if you do, okay. they're like built weird, right? And I think it has to do with like circuitry and gain staging or something. It's just like, it's like a weird thing that like no company really makes. But okay. so what I, I did was, is I got that pre as like the sort of inputs. And then right on top of it, I've got the outputs, which is the um, like, you know, XLRs to the house. Mm -hmm. And in between those two things is the X32, right? And the X32 allows us with our phones or the laptop to sort of like, route the signal, give ourselves leveling for ears and stuff and effects and all of that. And so by the time it gets to the house, all of the stuff is like already dealt with all the wetness is already handled. Mm -hmm. And it's just like the people in, in the, in the soundboard can like kind of decide what they want to do from there. So we have right, you have your own giving to them. And then if yeah. they need to alter something, they can, but you're like, we're sending you the good signal that we like. Yeah, exactly. Okay. The opinionated right. signal, so to speak. Yeah. I, I found like when touring that like, um, depending on the kind of rapport you have with the sound guy, like they may or may not care at all about whether or not your sound is good. Oh yeah. And it's like kind of a weird thing. And I find that eliminating as much of the decision-making as possible on their end is kind of my go, my go-to strategy. And that is not to say that I don't trust our sound guys. However, right. No, I get where you're coming from. <laughs> um, however, it's just like, I want to make the show as like repeatably high quality as I can. Mm -hmm. And so like, I want it to sound how it's supposed to sound within reason. Like it's, you know, modifiable volumes and things like this, but it's not like harsh effects, you know, it's not like harshly wet and like effects overdrive where it's just like too crazy. It's, yeah. it's fairly clean, but it's got all the things and all the throws and the effects that we're controlling live. I don't know how else we would even do that. Like, because like we couldn't do master bus effects if, if they were receiving the dry signals, you know what I mean? I think it'd mm -hmm. just be weird. And that's also the type of thing where you don't want to have like a bus out with wet effects for a master. That's like kind of defeats the purpose. Cause it still sounds clean. Like you want to destroy it. Like yeah. you want it to be fucked up. Right. So that's right. kind of the, the whole point. And like, the user vibe, the user vibe in general is like, is, you know, going back to the new, the, the lead speak thing is, is like, it was sort of an homage to like the hacker spirit, mm -hmm. like tearing things apart, dissecting, having a little bit of a grudge, just like the whole vibe of like, you know, it's like the hacker spirit, I guess you could say. And like, so that's kind of pervasive in the lyrics and the sound in the visuals, in the setup, like, it's all just like a little bit fucked up. And yeah. like, it's kind of the point, you know what I mean? Like, right. yeah. that's the point. So I think I like, like um, you know, it's been, and it's been like, you know, very repeatable once we got that whole setup really working properly. Oh, and also, uh, 
it also has um you know the wireless stuff for like in your monitors and it also has like a guitar wireless thing that's already patched in so like all right literally just take my guitar flip it on put on my headphones flip them on and i built like a router that's like um th that's like inside of the of the rack that um like kind of uh, emits a 5g signal wi-fi signal and all of those things are talking over that including the wireless dmx so you have something lights. that's actually emitting a wi-fi signal yeah and so oh. we've got dmx lights that are actually um wireless and so oh, when wow. i flip okay, yeah. on yeah when i just flip the power on on my rack the wi-fi kicks on the cell phone automatically changes to that network my dmx lights automatically start pulling from ableton because it's like i have a dmx to um like i can't remember what the protocol is but it's basically like um dmx to ethernet and okay. i have that hardwired into a, like a little junction box next yeah. to the router and so <laughs> how did that happen what the I hell think it's like it's like doing this um wow so okay, it's like basically people like people who are listening to the audio he made a he made a form yeah. with his hands and hearts just shout out of them yeah, on I've the video that this, they do that on zoom too like that's, that's like a new thing <laughs> Um, okay, continue. So like, basically, like, we have, uh, like an Ethernet to DMX converter box, and that thing is hardwired into the little Wi Fi router. And the Wi Fi router is receiving its DMX signal from my laptop over the network, which is mm -hmm. also connected to the network. And that's emitting the DMX signal from Ableton, which is like doing a live playback rig. So it's like, all of it just works. So I flip the switch, and it just all connects. And I have no setup. And that's what's awesome is there is like, it's very high quality, but very repeatable and very simple to like deploy. And like, okay, it took a lot of trial and error over the years to like figure out like what I wanted to index in more versus less. Cause like, you know, I've had, I've had, you know, I'll give you a really specific example. When I was in Seattle in the early days of user, I was playing a show at this place called the central saloon during a really bad electrical storm. Mm -hmm. And something happened that caused my interface to fry. Mm. And so the jack, it was a USB like bus powered interface, like just a crappy focus, right? Interface. Mm -hmm. um, and some surge happened and it caused the interface to fry on the USB port. And so like, if I touched it at all, it would reset as if oh, it wow. had lost power, but then it would kick back on again. And so my show abruptly stopped in the middle of the show after lightning or something had struck. And like, it was super crazy and super hard to sort of um, diagnose in the moment, especially with like lights and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it really was like, oh no, his show is falling apart. So the very first thing I tried to do when I was going on tour across the US was is to get a an interface that had actual power, like a power supply. It wasn't USB powered, right? And so like mm, I got okay, an 18 yeah. IA Scarlet interface and I used that in the way that I currently use my X32. And so I had my little rolling rack and I was flying around and driving around with it. And, um, and you know, I had a simpler setup. So I only had the MIDI controller and all the patches would change throughout the music. So it was very straightforward. Um, and we had another guy who was doing lights like with MIDI controllers, like live, right? And mm -hmm. um, the problem was though, is that having to like plug in stuff, having to like do all the cabling, like that was really hard to do in between sets and like tearing it all down was always a mess. So like just trying to get things that were as fault tolerance as possible. So that way they wouldn't fuck up in a show. Yeah. I wouldn't have to diagnose them. The routing was super straightforward. Like the ins and outs on the patch bay are all labeled with glow in the dark tape. Like it's just like super obvious. And, and then because we wanted to be able to expand the repertoire with like more instruments and more live playing to make it a more live friendly, like more interesting to watch, that meant we needed better in-ears. And so like, that's why the X32 came along and that's why we have the inputs and outputs like with the X32 sitting in between. Mm -hmm. So like literally everything we plug in goes into our ears at whatever level we want. And then all of those things separately go to the house. Have you ever thought of sharing the specs on this? Because basically the whole time you're talking about this, my drummer and my guitar player 
talk about this kind of concept all the time and they're always trying to figure out different ways to do it. We're, we're a four piece band. So it's a little bit more. Plus we got a drum set and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But they're always trying to go for inner monitors, trying to have some sort of way that we can, cause we have our studio and that's where we do most of our stuff and live streams and all that kind of stuff. So, it, you know, par for the course, it's all tricked out and we use all the stuff that we can, but then we go play a show and it's like, Oh, we can't bring all this stuff and it's going to take us two hours to set up for an opening act, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to, happy to share that with you. I I'd think love it's to hear, fairly uh, straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of the stuff that you mentioned is stuff I've heard them talk about and they yeah. love gear and they, and, they, and my, my drummer is a, a kind of a MacGyver type guy. He's an electrician and builds oh, yeah. well, like all of his own stuff. Also, quick side note, just because it's driving me crazy and I need to just compliment you on it. I love your EGA shirt. And is that a Mystery Science Theater sh uh, sanctioned shirt? So watch this out is um, Watch Out for Snakes. This is like a, a friend in the community who is like an uh, like a, you know, eight bit oh, electronic I, artist. And, but um, it is from it is a line from the movie EGA. Okay. which is a 1960s movie with a uh, big tall guy played jaws in the John, uh, the bond movies. Interesting. Yeah. I learned yes. something new every day. I mean, so like <laughs> in my short time in this scene, I've played with a lot of different artists, maybe a hundred different artists and mm -hmm. watch out for snakes is one of the guys that I used to do live streams with during the pandemic. And he oh, okay. is, is kind of into the chip tune guitar thing. And, um, he, has an aesthetic of like comic book stuff. Mm -hmm. So he gets invited to perform at like, you know, like, you know, comic con type of conventions and things like this. And he's like that kind of a, he's in that space, I guess you could say, but this okay. shirt is it's just a fun shirt. It's like yeah. good color. I like how it feels. It's like a good, you know, yeah, as, no, as I, a fellow tech person, you know what I'm saying? When right. you go to a convention and you get a really <laughs> yeah. comfortable shirt, it, it literally can be falling off of your back and you'll still choose that over most of your other stuff. Exactly. No, yeah. I only, cause I could only see the saying on the top. So I thought I couldn't see what was underneath. And it's mm. actually, it's like one of the most famous lines from that movie. It's a B movie. Yeah. No, that's a cool shirt. It looks like a choose your own adventure book. I love that. Oh yeah. No, he's got really cool shirt designs. All of them are really sick. Nice. Mine are very boring in comparison. Mine's just like a logo. <laughs> yeah. What kind of merch are you doing uh, for your band? So I um, set up like basically one of the things that I like always find a little bit annoying is like having a box of merch with me mm -hmm. at all times. Like I just find it annoying. And and so I usually when I do, when I buy like 50 shirts or something, I will just go to shows and just give them out to people that I know in the scene. Oh. Because like I just don't want to have the storage. I live in an apartment in the city. I just don't have a lot of space. And like I find that like you know, the people that genuinely like my music that come to a lot of my shows, like I want to convey to them that I appreciate them and I don't want to like squeeze them for dollars. Like it's just not, you know, I don't really care. So <laughs> I like to give my shirts out as a gift to people hmm. usually. Okay. But the side effect of that is, is that I don't make shirts very often. And then, right. And then on the side of that, I also have like a separate channel for that, which is like a drop shipping type of deal where it's like, if you go to user.threadless.com, you can choose yeah. from a few different designs and you can just have your own shirt made. And it's like 25 bucks or something like that. A few. Do you do uh, the drop shipping through Threadless or are you doing yeah, it through Yeah, Threadless like makes the shirt, they mail okay. it, they do all the, the handling of the, the prices and stuff. So it's like, I mean, not the prices, but I mean like the payment processing. And yeah, it's just very easy and hands off. I think, mm -hmm. you know, that's just kind of like um, another function of my lack of space and, and my like desire to do less. Yeah, <laughs> no, I get that. And um, now I also want to mention, so the way that I found out about you was I'm part of a group of people. It's uh, they've changed the name several times, but essentially it's an awards show for Creative Commons musicians. No way. And and a couple of years ago, you were one of the nominees for it. And this is really? I keep talking to them. They should like let people know that this is happening. They kind of let people know after the fact. What they do is they essentially scour the internet for people that release music under Creative Commons. And um your song uh Nightmare was one of the songs that was no was on way. the list. I yeah. had no idea. And that's how I found out about you and I discovered your stuff. And I have a playlist of Creative Commons music that I put Whoa. on Spotify and YouTube. 
and yours was on there. And I'm kind of going through and wanting to meet some of these musicians. Yeah, I had no One, idea that ever happened. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. And it, so did, this is the other thing I found out too, because I've talked to some other musicians that I've met through this organization. Um, uh, did you mean to release stuff under Creative Commons? Or And I think as a web developer, maybe you lean more towards, but everybody else is kind of like, oh, I read this option on Bandcamp and it says, you know, people can download it and share it with friends and I'm cool with that. Like they don't really know. Yeah, I mean, I feel like like Bandcamp is the only place that I can even think of that even gives you that choice. Like I think like, yeah. like you know, if you're using DistroKid or whatever you're using as your distributor, it's like, the only real choice you have is, is like, do you want to enforce monetization on YouTube or not? Correct. Like with this, the yeah. content ID thing. And I think like that I find sort of annoying and limiting because I'm like constantly like, you know, dealing with, mm -hmm. you know, the sort of things that come with that. And I think also that becomes very annoying when you're tagging yourself and your own music on social media and then it like strikes you because it doesn't know your account is tied right. to the distro kid, all of that stuff. And like, so generally I try to turn those things off just for a quality of life. But yeah. like also during the pandemic when Twitch started changing their rules about content ID and they mm -hmm. got very punitive and they started like, you know, striking people's pages and stuff. I decided to like take my back catalog and turn off content ID. Hmm. And then I basically tweeted about it like, hey, if you need music to play on Twitch, like this is not going to get you in trouble. Just enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And like, so I'd say like philosophically, yeah, like I'm aligned with that spirit. I didn't do it intentionally this record. I, I think I just did it out of like not wanting to deal with the bureaucracy of the tooling. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but at the same time, I also didn't know that my song was heard by that group. And I also didn't know that it was nominated for anything. And yep. that's crazy. That's why like, I keep telling them they should crazy, reach so. out to people. Yeah. I'm one of the I'm one of the uh, regional judges and the people that run it uh, are and started it and everything. It's all very much like they the, it's the reaching out to people that mm. they never seem to do until after the fact to let them know that they won, like kind of going, here's well, the website where you're, it says that you won. And that's well, really you all know, it is. You know it's what's like crazy about that is, is that like music, like artists on social media, like their whole shtick is to promote and to get yeah. stuff to their audience. And no, so I agree. Like, that would just bolster your org too. Like. Yeah. seems strange to me to not do that part of it, but <laughs> right. Well, and now they're focusing a lot on, and they're talking a lot more about net label day. Uh, and uh, we, my band is currently on a net or releases some of our stuff on a net label called block Sonic, which is more of a hip hop label, but they mm -hmm. also do alternative music. And, cool. uh, and they're, yeah, they've been dealing with that and like trying to turn it into net label week because a day is kind of, you know, it's, it's hard to get people to go listen to net labels. It's not a place you can go visit and walk mm. to, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. But yeah, it's a, it's a neat little thing. And that's how I just, mm. I just wanted to let you know. That's how I found that's out. That's really cool. It. I'd love more info about that after. Yeah, no, I call. can send you some info for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. I definitely will say like, Hey, whoever's running that thing, the fact that I had no idea that ever happened, like that's a miss. You guys got to fix that. <laughs> well, we'll see what their comment is on this. Cause like, I know that they do listen to, to this podcast. I would have like repped it so hard. You know, because it's like those types of things don't happen very often. Like yeah. people are very sort of like in their own space and they're thinking about their own stuff. And I think like the 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 opportunity for community to sort of lift each other up is something that needs to happen yeah. more. And so like we can't help unless we know about it. Which um, they are doing. They're yeah. not doing it. They're not not contacting people on purpose. It's just it's yeah. it's, you know, it it's happens. Tough. <laughs> it happens. Now, um, so I'll tell you a little bit about that song, actually. So, oh, yeah. Tell um, me about that. So Nightmare was one of those songs. So I like in order to It's got a to, great like, beat, by the way. I love the beat on it. That was one of my favorite tell things. tell you all sorts of interesting things about that. So um, the user show with guitar required that I basically write guitar parts for all my previously released music mm -hmm. because it wasn't guitar music in the beginning. And once I like... Travis and I started playing live together. We basically built guitar parts for all of the music, right? So like 100% mm -hmm. of the songs had the option now. And um, I decided that with um, Rise of the Midnight Sun that I was going to start writing stuff that was intentionally meant for that. And okay. Nightmare in particular was like a very guitar-centric song, right? It was like 
leading with that that riff and I loved the idea of multi-tracking everything like eight to 10 times. And so there's just a million layers of guitars and everything. So like the guitar mm-hmm. solo in that song, for instance, is four layers yeah. of me playing the same thing, which is like hilarious because like I would just stay up super late at night while my wife was in asleep in bed and I would just bang my head against the wall to get those riffs exactly, exactly the same over really? and over again. And I would, and I would write the riff as I was recording. So I would like, basically I'm very busy during the day with my job and with life and stuff. And so I don't really have a lot of time to write in advance. So usually the lyrics that I write are kind of written on the spot Hmm. and the riffs and the solos are written on the spot. And then I kind of retry and retry until I get something right. And then, and then after that, like if I want to like multi-track it, I'll just keep trying to do what I just did. And, um, Sometimes if you're kind of like doing the stream of consciousness, like compositional style, like it can be hard to even sort of remember what you did without spending a lot of stoppage time to go and analyze. And I think like that can be a momentum killer. But yeah. the the whole idea was, is that like, I just wanted it to be a guitar centric song. The other thing is, is that like, there's sort of like elements of like Nirvana and Nine Inch Nails and just and Manson and just stuff like that, that I think is like kind of an homage to like my metal days as a younger person. And like, um, I had gotten this drum pack from, uh, it was called like circles, dead drums or something. Hmm. And, um, they have a lot of ads on Instagram or whatever. And so like, it was just, I was looking for like samples of dead drums, like just really thumpy seventies ish drums. And the reason why it was because I was writing, uh, stuff for my other project called Wolf Pet, which is kind of like shoegazy, happier version of electronic, folky stuff. So it's kind of like user, oh. but happy, right? Okay. And um, and uh, the song Games, for instance, on Rise of the Midnight Sun is actually mm-hmm. a collab with Wolf Pet because this whole sonic palette is different than the rest of the album. So like I used that as an explanation of like why it doesn't sound like the rest of it. So and, you um, collabed with yourself on it is what I mean, you're saying. It, well, the thing is, <laughs> is that I've spent a lot of time alienating my audience by writing so many different genres. And so like I'm trying okay. to do right by them by actually separating them now, <laughs> like into different <laughs> projects. Um, but, uh, but so like, yeah, the riff was like super guitar centric, the solo, I kind of like improvised it and then I re-recorded it multiple times. And if you go look on my Instagram, like maybe, I don't know, 20 posts back, you'll see one of me playing the guitar at my desk and it shows all of the layers overlaid on each other in transparency okay. and you can see me playing it. Um, and uh, then the, the kind of the refrain of the song, like, you know, you can live in a nightmare too. Like the way that the harmony is structured was sort of like a nod to Nirvana, the way that they do those like major chord harmonies Mm -hmm. while saying self-deprecating things is like kind of the Nirvana spirit um, just in terms of that vibe. And I had been in Iceland and I was like, having horrible jet lag and i had just like gone to some exhibit where they were explaining the vikings who discovered the island and da 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 and they were kind of like talking about all that like these warring tribes and all of this and these tough people and and i was thinking about the vikings and i was sitting in the lobby of my hotel with like this like scandinavian leather furry (laughs) <laughs> you know, mood lighting and all this random shit everywhere. And I was like yeah. two in the morning, three in the morning. I was super tired, but not sleepy. And so I started writing this drum part. Mm-hmm. And there's literally backbeats on top of backbeats. There's like 20 layers of drums. It's like super complicated. But then I just kind of like tucked them in and I made like the kick and the snare real heavy. And like that kind of makes the groove come together. Yeah. And I started to write the lyrics um, kind of about the Viking thing, right? Like, I was born deep in a mountain, um, uh, something, 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 burning fire. I struck my fist into the stone and then thought it exploded. Like, it's literally like me sort of like just like regurgitating some of the, the vibes that I had sort of taken in. Yeah. But the lyrical kind of the sort of punchline of the song is like, you can live in a nightmare too. Um, it's basically saying like, Hey, like whatever you want to be your emotional reality, like 
it's like you're you decide mm-hmm. like if you want to be sad if you want to be angry if you want to be happy it's all up to you and you have to just decide what kind of life you want you mm-hmm. can make a nightmare for yourself to live in if you want to right yeah but you probably don't need to do that to yourself you know what i mean and so you like the imagery <laughs> that i had sort of borrowed from the viking thing was like sort of like me um like kind of like painting this picture of like such a tumultuous life and then in the chorus being like hey like it doesn't really have to be like this Mm -hmm. you know what i mean and um and i kind of have a lot of lyrics like in like those types of themes in them because like as a quote unquote like overachiever in my career and like the burn your candle at both ends type of guy who will work all day long and then stay up super late working on other projects. I'm just constantly killing myself with this idea that time is running out and I need to work harder and I need to create things. And like the problem with that is that it's emotionally exhausting. You feel burned out. You beat yourself up over stuff. That's really not that big a deal. And it's like you kind of create this emotional prison for yourself in a way by kind of doing that. Mm-hmm. And like, I've just sort of arrived at life recently at the idea that it's okay to do nothing and achieve nothing with a day. Like to just sit back and do nothing with my day and let time pass and to not work on anything. Like that's perfectly okay. And right. like, I'm about 20 years into my career and like, I'll tell you that that idea came pretty late. Like, I feel like the constant burnout for almost two decades was like, you know, that's my nightmare, right? Like that kind of thing. So like, um, and then the album, which was originally supposed to be called glow, which was, you know, it was the song glow was like the sort of thematic, right cornerstone of that in the sense that it was like well, a big kind of remix album later so you know yeah. it's good <laughs> well so like but then when i was on my trip to iceland i was having a lot of lack of sleep and doing a lot of self-reflection and and so a lot of the lyrics that started to come out of that were about like me kind of like growing up or like discovering things about myself like in the same way that nightmare was like me sort of like commenting on my own bad sort of um habits Mm-hmm. Well, Rise of the Midnight Sun, well, we were there in the dead of December and like mid-December where they had mm-hmm. 45 minutes of daylight. Mm-hmm. But for eight hours a day, it was like this constant sunset where like there was like this pink dusk. So it was like light out, but it was like a California sunset just all day long. And then you would get this little sunlight and then it'd go back down like that again for another few hours. And then it would just be pitch black. And so like thematically that stuck with me and it was rise of the midnight sun. Mm, And then it started to represent like self-discovery and growth. Right. I was sort of like coming out, you know, and um, so like games was written almost like a eulogy to myself, like about all the mistakes I've made and how I had to make those mistakes to learn things in my life. Um, Nightmare was about sort of like, you know, self punishment with like bad habits and things like this. Hello yeah. world. The opening track was kind of like about me sort of like realizing that like, I can't just grind forever. Like I do have a mortality and like, I need to be careful, you know, and like mm-hmm. basically just acknowledging that that happened. <laughs> um, you know, try again was like a song where it was just like, Hey, like if you fail, it's fine, dude, just move on. You know, like it's not that big a deal, you know? Um, just lots of those types of things. Like those lyrics all just kind of came together. Um, and they were all sort of unintentionally in the same theme. And so they ended up becoming rise of the midnight sun and not glow. Hmm. Glow was like the party version of that album. Rise <laughs> right. of the midnight sun was like the therapist's version of that album. <laughs> well, now I feel weird as- asking this one last question, which is with all that and this all sounding like the accomplishment of what the album was, what do you have coming up? What albums are you working? Or do you have an album or things that you have coming out right now that you'd like to tell people about? So, um, yes and no. So like the way that I write music is, is that I will write uh, an idea or a riff or a lyric or something. And then like 30 seconds worth of music and I'll just put it away and I'll just not come back to it for six months. (laughs) Same. And so right now (laughs) in my private SoundCloud link, where I just kind of share my own ideas and listen to it as an audience person, while I work just to hear what I would do differently. Yeah. Well, I have 
17 unreleased songs and I have another 21 songs for Wolf Pet and I have a whole album <laughs> worth of the evening stuff and I have just released a new album under a different project name called Mannequin, which oh. is like my dark synth version of me, right? Okay. <clears throat> so like if you go look at Mannequin with a K, like M-A-N-A-K-I-N, you'll see like a, a photograph of like a shiny, glossy robot mannequin. And that is user just doing vocalist dark synth, just straight up industrial oh, club mis okay. music. And and then Wolf Pet <clears throat> is kind of like the shoegazy thing. And so like, I just have a ton of projects. And the other thing is, is that I've been producing a lot of other artists lately. Oh. Um, just because like, I wanted to sort of like help lift up other artists that, you know, I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't say they need the help, but just like in general that like they would benefit from having, you know, all the time in the years that I put into my craft, like they would benefit from that, you know? Okay. And, um, and I think that they're great artists or whatever. And so like, you know, I want to lift them up. And so I've done that for like some of the kind of, there's a guy that I've been working with. His name is Elfin. He's kind of like, I want to say he's kind of like the sultry smoky kind of like male version of Lana Del Rey. He's got a great mm. voice. Um, did some stuff um, with some of my electronic friends, um, done a bunch of like those types of collabs, but yeah, I just have a bunch of stuff that's kind of like half cooked right now. And I think, okay. like, and I think I'm going to release some of my previously unreleased stuff that was like meant to go on other albums and just kind of let those be. I love it when there. people do that. Those are always fun. Yeah. Those are always great because it's one of those, like, you don't know what to expect sort of things. So, all right. No, that's yeah. great. Yeah. No, okay. I'm really excited. I just think, the the other thing though is is that like me sort of like letting go of like the constant grind mentality also means that I'm not doing music as often as I was like yeah well I, I'm gonna have to beg to differ with you on what all the announcements you just made about the stuff you're working on but I'm well, sure that's it's what I'm saying less is like was. all of that is a product of my like hyper yeah. hyper working right and like and like I feel like me now would not have created all that. Like, all right. <laughs> and if people did want to check out some of this stuff, where could they go do that? Um, I would say like Wolf Pet is on Spotify. Okay. User is on Spotify. User uh, with the three as the E. US three R. Um, Mannequin is on Spotify. You know, like I'm putting all these things out there publicly for the you know the sake of you know getting them heard and all of that. And um, yeah, who knows when a new album will materialize? Right. Um, but. You know, definitely some singles will be coming out. Oh, one other thing that I'll say here okay. is that, like, when I play live shows, um, because it's, like, electronic with instruments on top of it, it's not necessarily just a band playing something, you know, with with no backing. To, let, to break up the monotony and make it less boring for people who are super familiar with my music, I just rewrite the arrangements completely, and I have, like, totally new backing tracks to songs. Yeah. And... So I use those songs as sort of like an A-B test, like to figure out which things are like really vibing with a crowd or not. And whichever ones come float to the surface, those ones become music for my new albums a lot hmm. of the time. And so like, for instance, there was a song called Electricity on the album Influence. And that album was recorded in the same studio that Alice in Chains used to record in and stuff like. Ooh, nice. Wonderful studio called Al Orbit and downtown Seattle. And um, that song I had been playing as something else, like with different lyrics and stuff. And I was playing in a show and there were these super gothed out people standing in the very front with like, like straight up like the, like, you know, the white face with the black shit, like the whole, yeah. like, I would say it's like the Norwegian metal look. Right. And right. Like, the, like the King diamond sort of thing. Yeah. And I was playing, the 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 music to electricity and as i was kind of doing my thing i looked up and i noticed that they had turned to each other and they were dancing really intensely huh. and they weren't watching me anymore they were just taken over by the moment they were really dancing aggressively and they were really into it and then i noticed that people behind them were also doing that too they weren't watching me anymore <laughs> they were looking at each other okay and they were dancing and I was just like, oh, that's, I want to chase that feeling. I love that feeling of like people like kind of losing themselves in the moment to the music yeah. that I am creating for the room. And so I took that and I put it on influence and I wrote the song electricity and it was kind of like, uh, I would say like the lyrics are sort of like talking to a partner, hmm. like 
not suggestively, but like it sort of captures the vibe of like what they must have been feeling like at that moment. And um, that was kind of like an A-B test gone right. Yeah. So like, you know, a lot of the stuff that I have currently in my live set right now, I would say probably four or five of those songs are just begging for new vocals right now. And so like, who knows what's happening tonight after I hang up with you? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, that's just yeah. me. Like, that's what it's going right. to be like until you've I already die. Got, you've already created the, your own ideas in your head that you may start working on after we're done here. <laughs> and, and, and like the, the cool thing about like letting things just sit in the folder is, is that like you have an internal dialogue that's running 24 seven. Yeah. And so like, you're kind of making decisions about stuff and like letting life shape and mold your ideas without you even realizing it mm -hmm. by the time you come back to that song now you've got all these opinions about how it should be mm -hmm. and like that doesn't really happen live when you're writing something in a one hour span i mean i love writing music end to end really fast because i feel like it's the chord changes and the arrangements are more organic and they more make sense mm -hmm. So like the longer something sits in the DAW, the more sort of like weird the arrangement gets, in my opinion, because you can sort of just like tinker with things in ways that it wouldn't make sense to play live. Right. Yeah. So I think there's like this spectrum, like either it like it's organically really good and natural and it makes a lot of sense for like music or you've ruminated on it a million years. And now this thing is like this, like really specific time capsule in your heart or whatever, like, and like, Somewhere in between, I think, is a healthy medium. And I have plenty of half-written songs sitting in my folders right now. So <laughs> we just All have right. to figure that out. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I'm glad we were finally able to hook up. Yeah, man. It was a, a total pleasure. And thanks again. For